Welcome back, everyone. How was the coffee? Did you guys have a coffee? They're still chatting. It was that good. I love it. All right, so to kick the day off, give the warmest of TNW welcomes to Robert Bruner and Anouk Fugos. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for joining. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining, Robert. Yes, thank you. Glad to be very, very, very happy to be here. And wonderful introduction. Yes, no, it was great. It was, so it was we have 20 minutes, so let's dive right into it. Right. We thought it was 30. Yes, <laughs> yes, 20. so we're going to do it in a little truncated way, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Robert, you've had a very extensive career. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what I would like to start with is, is looking back a little bit the time that you were in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. uh, working at Apple. But if, because I think people in the audience probably with all the things that are happening, also bad things, I guess, concerns that we have in tech today, there's still a bit of nostalgia whenever people sort of think about Silicon Valley in the early yeah. days, the, yes. the 90s and the yeah. 80s. So tell us a little bit what was it like and what do you miss most about that time? Yeah, it was, it was amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm actually a rare child of the computer industry. My father um, designed disk drives at IBM in the 60s. Wow. I grew up there and uh, was a, a rare local. But, you know, in the beginning, as I got out of university, um, it was not, it was challenging, right? It was, it's an engineering-driven community, right? Very, very much about technology and being very technical. In many ways, it still is. But design was looked at as this sort of dressing, window dressing, right? They're going to put racing stripes on it and, and make it more, more effective. And we would, I mean, literally be handed just a bag of parts and say, you know, skin this, make it look pretty, right? Yeah. And so, so that, that, was, that was challenging because you really couldn't get, you know, to the core of making things what they are and what they need to be. Um, but, but that started to change, I think, in, you know, after a few, working a few years, um, some, some um, great designers came over from Europe. Um, Bill Margridge from ID2 and founded IDO with, with David Kelly and um, Hartmut Esslinger and Frog Design. And it started to elevate you know, the notion of design in the valley and, mm -hmm. and, and, and really began to change the way people viewed it. You know, to fast forward today, it's, it's very much designers are part of the equation of, of deciding what things are and what they should be and what they could be. Um, you know, we've gone through some ups and downs. There was a period a few years ago where every, design was the buzzword, right? Everybody was on the bandwagon, hiring people, investing in it. And then they figured out it's actually really hard, right? <laughs> you can't just hire talent and expect it to happen. So it's kind of gotten to this place where it's embedded and it's, it's, it's really part of the fabric of the valley. Yeah, and I, I think I, I read somewhere of you mentioned that, or you joke about it, that sort of when you die, you think your tombstone will read, <laughs> guy that hired Joni Ivey. Yeah, Does it no, bother you? Do people always bring that up? Yeah, no, I, I often joke that's that what will be famous for is the, the man who hired Jonathan Ive, right? <laughs> but, uh, uh, which, you know, was a fantastic, you know, part of the history in that period of going to Apple and sort of building the industrial design team, you know, from nothing almost, and, and, and having this amazing studio, which, you know, got Johnny to come over and, and help, help do that. And, of course, you know, the rest is history, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, so, and Oh, well, you asked me, what, what do I miss, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, you know, the thing that's interesting, at that time when I started, it was, very, um, it was very collegial. I mean, there was probably four or five of us, you know, that were really driving what was going on. And then literally, we were all in Palo Alto, and every Friday night, we would go over to somebody's office and have beers, you know. And even though we were competitors, it was, you know, it was this very, you know, tight community. And, and then at that time, the craft of design was very different, right? You have an amazing array of tools to use today. At that point, I started out working on a you know, drafting board with a calculator, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, the, but then as things came along, it changed. And you know, so, so there's aspects I miss of that sort of being very, very focused and very, very personal, right? It's now big, big and uh, huge amounts of money. And, you know, yeah. So. yeah, so I think even for a young designer today in Silicon Valley, in the tech industry, somewhere else, will be very different maybe from your experience back at the time. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. It's, it's, it's quite a bit different. It's great, there's amazing opportunity. It's just fantastic, but it's, it's a very different place. It changes all the time. That's one thing that, that makes it amazing is that there is always something new. Yeah. Um, obviously, you didn't stop at Apple. You moved yeah. on to go to Pentagram. Um, you've been uh, the lead designer for Beats by Dre, mm -hmm. uh, now Ammunition, uh, your design agency that you are the co-founder of. Yes. Um, I would like to talk a bit about your sort of design philosophy. Um, so what separates good design from, from great design? 
Uh, that's, that's, that's a great question. Actually, I, I'm working on a book about that exact topic, right? It's called, called Making Great Stuff. Uh, you know, good design is, is um, usable. You know, it's useful. It's desirable, right? It, it, it's built on a process. You need ta talent. You need an opportunity. You need all these things to do it, right? Um, you know, it creates things that are attractive and attainable and manufacturable, right? Um, great design is um, empowering. Um, great design creates change. Um, great design is transformative, right? And, and to get there, it's a completely different level, right? And, and, it, and it ultimately, it's a very human thing. It's driven by, driven by passion and driven by vision and usually driven by a small number of individuals that have a religious commitment to making it just right. You know, and so these are things that sort of start to drive the things that are really great and, and take that, that enormous amount of investment and time to get there. And, and what is an example of great design that you are most proud of? Oh, well, you know, be, uh, Beats is one, because it certainly was transformative for an industry, you know, and it, it, it changed quite a bit. And, and, and of course, the, the, the work that we've done at Apple. And, and of late, you know, we've had a number of things, you know, work that we, we've done for Square, work that we've done for Ember, work that we've done for Lyft, you know, that sort of just begin to change the sort of interaction that people have with technology and, and, and see it in a completely different way in their lives. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that you mentioned in, in an earlier interview that I, uh, in a podcast that you did, and I thought was really interesting, you said there's a great new generation of designers. They're very skilled designers, but you know what I see often lacking is actually storytelling skills, sales yeah. skills. Yes. So you actually say to to students, you know, do an improv uh, yeah. course or you know go to the theater, try to you know s sell your story basically. So is that something that people can learn, and and what should they do to? Well, you know, it, it's incredibly important, and I, and I do that because it's not something you're really taught in design school, right? If, if you think about the amount of effort and the amount of money and the amount of people that it takes to create a product and bring it in the world at scale, it's enormous, right? And if, you're, if you want to do something that is creating change, that is doing something different, you know, you have to convince this army of people about your vision, right? You re and, and you really need to tell a story. You really need to contextualize things. You really need to know how to engage people and bring them on to your mission. And those are things you aren't taught in design school, right? It, in, and and being, like, being able to be in front of an audience of intelligent people like this and, and, and articulate something, it, it takes time and it takes effort and it takes work. Yeah. You know, and so it's something I talk to students. Yeah, I say, go take a comedy class, right? You know, go take a public speaking class. <laughs> really the worst possible thing that you can do if you, you know, have sort of bombed on stage like everything else. Like yeah. a sales pitch will be perfect. Yeah. It'll be very yeah. easy. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, it, it's, it's an important part of the job. You know, really, it's, I mean, obviously you have to have the ability, you have to have the talent, you have to have the vision, you have to have the lab, but you really need to know how to convince people of what yeah. to do it. And I think another thing, and that's, that's empathy, right? Sort of understanding what you're using, and specifically, if you're a product designer, you're going to design something that's going to be built for a large audience. Many people should be able to use it. You have yep. to sort of be able to step inside mm. you know, anyone else's shoes, basically, to, yep. uh, to make it. So is, is there, do you have like a trick for that, or how does it work? How is your design process? Well, you, know, you mentioned the word empathy, and I think that's one of the, the uh, as a designer, and really anyone that's working on creating something with people, is, is having this ability to put yourself in their lives, in their shoes. You we, we spend so much time, and it's always natural to design things for yourself, right? And, and what you've experienced and what you believe, and that, that's important. But ultimately, at some point, you have to be able to understand how you're going to deliver something into someone's lives. And that, you know, the title of the talk is something, an important question we ask at the beginning of every project is this idea of what's worth designing in the first place, right? Again, if you're going to spend all this time and money, you should figure out what's worth designing. And, and really and understand who it's going to and, and what it needs to do and, and what, it's, what it should cost and, all, and what are you trying to solve in their lives. All these things you, know, you should really understand before you go out and spend five, 10, 25, 50 million dollars doing it, right? Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I sometimes get the feeling, specifically now in recession days, that you know, the budgets are even uh, smaller and you actually, you know, there's maybe even more pressure to design something or innovate something that's actually going to be used. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. 
Um, so another thing that I was really interested uh, to learn a bit more, sort of we talked about your creative process, but maybe to have like a more tangible example, like what does your process look like from start to finish if we talk about um, beats, for example? Yeah, well, you know, I, I mentioned this sort of, I have something that, I, I mean, our process is pretty linear and not, not entirely unique except for one thing, right? With, you know, we go through all this work of defining, you know, what it should be and building this framework of understanding before we design. Um, but then I, I take that, and I put it all aside, right, and ignore it, um, at least for a period of time. And I think this is really important that, it, you know, when you're going to go out and create something new, constraint is the last thing you want to do in the beginning, right? So what we do is I take that framework. My, I, I really piss off my strategy team and our UX team and say, that's fine. I'll get back to that later. Let's do a 360-degree look at what this thing could be in every possible direction without any constraints. And then as the, you know, some amazing things start to emerge, then you start to apply that framework, right? And, and it helps you decide what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Um, and the other thing is that then once you do, it's this incredibly rigorous process to make it happen, right? There's this phrase I love that happens in development, which is, it's not that I don't love it, I actually hate it, but it's a great phrase, it's the death of a thousand cuts. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you make all these incremental compromises, which you have to do to deliver something in volume, but if you don't manage it, by the time you get to the end, it, it's not what you started with. So, you know, with, with Beats, um, it, that was really an incredible experience that, you know, it, it, I found myself in this really odd position as Silicon Valley design nerd. All of a sudden, I'm hanging out with Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine, and, and you know, and it was really strange because we actually clicked, right? And I heard your kids were still quite surprised to learn that you're now. <laughs> yeah, I have this picture on stage with Dre and, and Diddy, and I when I showed that to my kids, they just like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, who, who is this person? Right. Um, it's not my dad. Um, but, you know, what the interesting thing was, you know, I, I, Jimmy used to drive me crazy, right? He would, like, call me up on a Saturday morning and it's like, what the fuck, Robert? What are you doing? You know, just constantly driving you. And then I saw this interview that he, oh, I read an interview he'd done in Rolling Stone, and, and, and he described working with, with artists, and it was exactly the same. And, and, you know, what I think the shared bond we had was we all viewed ourselves as artists, right? And, and we were out creating something in this business world. But... Uh, the process there was really interesting because, you know, when I looked at headphones, you know, the headphones are very functional things, right? They're driven by acoustics, they're driven by ergonomics, durability, reliability. And so you end up with these very articulated things you put on your body. And I, just, I remember doing this sketch where I drew a single line that ran from ear to ear, right? And that's what I want to do. I want to, you know, clean this all up and build this very graphic, iconic shape. Um, that took a, like, two years to engineer and get it to work. <laughs> but, but it was really important because what, you know, you know, Dre's thing was, you know, we're gonna create sound, you know, in the first meeting we had, he made this statement we put on the box. He said, people aren't hearing my music, right? Which, they, you know, he was crafting some of the most popular music in the world, but yet headphones were tuned to be very general, right? To, yeah. from, from an audiophile perspective. Um, Jimmy, he saw this for his audience that he understood very well. There was no high performance audio brand, right? Bose is your dad's headphone, right? And so, yeah. you know, so for, for, for kids looking to really have an amazing sound. And, and so, you know, we created this very, this, this very, this original studio, this very iconic product. And, and Jimmy, he treated it like a star, right? He put it in every video going out of Universal Music. He, every, Every artist that he knew was wearing it. Every athlete he knew was wearing it. Really, sort of influencing before influencer was a thing. Well, it's this thing that's very important, and uh, is cultural relevance. Yeah. Right? No. And, and when you have cultural relevance on a product, it's like ex an accelerant, right? And so the, the process was really about building this thing, getting it out in the world, and then driving it through this 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 marketing idea that that you said changed the industry. I remember two years after we built the headphone, I went to CES. And literally, 70% of the products had influence from our original product, right? It just changed the entire industry. Yeah. OK, so I want to go to, I guess, sort of the bigger creative elephant in the room, which is generative AI. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a topic that we will talk about pretty much every session uh, to, to everything, at least, that has to do with creativity in, the, in this conference. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe to start with, with the bigger question, like, what is your opinion on generative AI? Do you think it will think? In the end of the line, will it hurt creativity or will it help creativity? Well, I, I think 
that, that's the big question, right? Um, I mean, I, I'm an optimist, right? I mean, I, I often, when I, whenever I get around to pending a biography, I'm going to call it the um, oblivious optimist, because that's, that's me, right? It's a good mindset. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so right now, I, I and my team are viewing it as a tool, you know, and, and, and we're already using it in sort of creating conceptual pathways. You know, and so as we're looking at doing something, using it as a way to provoke the process and create new ideas, and, and that's, that's really valuable. Of course, you know, a lot of the things that we do to create some of these amazing images that take an enormous amount of labor and time um, are going to be automated. It's going to just disappear, that, that function. You know, so there's a lot of things like that. I, I think, though, the really prickly question that I keep coming around to is that, you know, for me and, and my, my viewpoint, the, the, the contribution the human element is incredibly important, right? And I, I think if you think about it, you know, the, the products that you love, that you're really engaged with, that have made an impact in your life, you can feel the hand of the designer. You can feel the thing, you know, that people did. I, I tell this story, I, when I was at Pentagram, um, the, one of my partners, an amazing designer and artist, Paula Cher, you know, I was at a meeting with her. We were working for Citibank, and she had, was developing their new identity when travelers merged with them. And in the very first meeting, just the kickoff, she sketched it, right? Went away, charged them half a million dollars, came back four weeks later and showed them this logo she would sketched in the first meeting. And they said, you know, why are we paying you all this money if you're, you know, you're, you're giving us the first doodle you ever did? And she said, well, that's not what you're buying. You're not buying my time. You're buying every movie I've ever seen, every painting I've ever done, every gallery I've ever visited, every building I've ever been in, right? I, you, you, as an individual, you build this amazing framework of an understanding of the world. Yeah. And, you know, it could be argued that that, 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 that can be re replicated in artificial intelligence. And yeah, I mean, to, it's the AI that has seen all the... All the yeah, the no, and, 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 and that will likely happen because, you know, what we do, you know, as there's a lot of what we do is based on philosophical framework. It's based on... Um, a process. It's based on a set of rules, right, that we follow and interpret as we go through stuff. So all that, you know, can, can happen. But I think the question for me is, what is it going to feel like, right? When that becomes pervasive, you know, what's going to separate good from great? Um, and, you know, I mean, maybe I'm old school, I've been doing this too long, but I still think that that human element is going to be there. But, but I do think our, my job is going to change and even, and, and in a good way, it's going to veer more towards um, defining and editing and, and, and building this thing. And so, much, so many other things may happen in the background. And it's not that different from when I, I'm old enough. I'm, I'm a lot older than I look. <laughs> um, you know, when the first CAD tools came into place, right? And went, you know, went from working on that drafting board to having that of automation. And what it did is it freed me up. I no longer had to worry about math. You know, prior to that, you had to be really good at trigonometry to figure out a product, right? That went away. And, and so I think, you know, what it will do I'm hopeful, and the optimism is it's going to free people up, free designers up, to spend more time on the important stuff, right? And really use those as tools to help, you know, take things out of the process and be done. But, like I said, I still believe that the human element is going to be critical, and that's, you know, what, what people, consumers, many times identify with, you know, and can yeah. And, and if we talk about the industry a bit more, so you know, companies like Canva or Adobe, like what do you think will happen to, to those companies? I mean, Adobe obviously has a, a wonderful tool out now. Yeah. You see all these other companies trying to integrate AI into their own platforms, but yeah. you think they sort of can keep up with, uh, with like separate platforms such as JetGPT, such as MidJourney or Stable Diffusion, or what will happen there? Well, you know, the, 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 I think so, right? I, I think they're gonna have to change their focus, you know, and really change their mindset about what they're creating. And, it's, and I think there's really, a blurring that's going to happen continually between tools and content. And, and really, you know, what, are, what are they providing now, right? Are they really providing um, you know, a, a content engine that, that is, is creating content on its own, right? And so it, it, it causes a change in thinking and a change of communication about what it is they're doing. It's going to be a radical, radical change for those companies in terms of what, what it is actually they're delivering to people. Yeah, definitely. But so in the end, you're an optimist. So all the people here in the audience that are working in creative industries, they will still have a job in 30 years from now? I believe so. I believe so. I mean, it's, it's again, I've, I've been doing this long enough to see these change points that happen and, and make that radical change. But, you know, the, the need for us to really sort of continually drive it. And, you know, the thing that's, well, one of the reasons I got into this is 
the, the relationship that people have with things really fascinates me. You know, I mean, if you think about it, we use, in many ways, objects, products, clothing, to define ourselves, right? The, the, the house you live in, the car you drive, the shoes you wear, the chair you sit in, all these things, they're functional, they provide a purpose, we need them, but the ones we choose, you know, say something about ourselves. And, and that, that connection people have with things is really important. And I think that's going to maintain this connection with the individuals that are, that are driving it. And it's just the process is going to change, the tools are going to change, the outputs are going to change. But I still believe we'll, we'll be there driving the bus. Yeah, as long as we're still designing for humans and not for robots, I guess uh, yeah, yeah, we're still yeah. worthy to, to put in. Uh, it, it's a really interesting time. You know, it, Definitely, it really yeah. is. And you know, as again, I'm, I'm not viewing it as, you know, holy shit, am I going to be out of a job? I'm viewing it, you know, how are we going to figure this out? What are we going to do with it? And how can we make it really interesting for our audience? Right. Great. Right. Okay, guys, I think that was all the time we have. Uh, well, we do have a Q&A where everyone who wants to ask a question directly to Robert uh, can do so. It will be at the TW Talk stage, I think, in 10 minutes. So uh, if you're interested, if you have a question for Robert, if you want to just, you know, uh, share your frustrations about generative AI or mm -hmm. whatever you want to do, uh, feel free to, uh, to join us. Thank all you right. so much. Thank you. Robert. Thank you very much.